You are listening to Parliament Matters, a Hansard Society production supported by the Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust. Learn more at hansardsociety.org.uk slash pm. Welcome to Parliament Matters, the podcast about the institution at the heart of our democracy, Parliament itself. I'm Ruth Fox. And I'm Mark Darcy. Coming up... Torn to rags. A fortnight ago, he reached the dizzy heights of being a Parliament Matters guest. Now he's a parliamentary pariah. What next for William Ragg? Will they? Won't they? Dare they? If the government does back a motion to investigate the Speaker's conduct, is that the end for Sir Lindsay Hoyle? Former Commons clerk Paul Evans drops by to ponder an emerging crisis. And the mystery of the disappearing all-party parliamentary groups. Have they really gone, or have they just gone underground? But first, William Ragg... What to say about this? This is quite extraordinary. As Ruth was saying, two weeks ago, William Ragg was a guest on this programme talking about all sorts of high matters of public policy, and now he is a high matter of public policy, I suppose. It, it turns out that the Conservative MP for Hazelgrove and chair of the Public Administration Committee had been sending what are coyly termed as intimate pictures to someone he met on a dating app online, and those pictures were then used to coerce him into giving contact details of other MPs and Westminster journalists. And this has launched a whole scandal around what's called spear phishing, the use of online coercion of this type to get people to give up information, to get leverage against them, I suppose. No one's actually quite sure who was doing this yet as well. This was an anonymous attempt in names of people calling themselves Abby and Charlie, and several MPs appear to have fallen for it. It's not just William Ragg, two of the people whose contacts he gave up apparently also gave some of those coyly entitled intimate images to these people, whoever they are. Is it a foreign government? Is it a journalist? Is it some random person with some obscure agenda of their own to discredit Parliament or damage a particular political party? We just don't know at the moment. But it's left William Ragg a pretty discredited figure with a lot of people very angry at him. He's already resigned his posts as vice chair of the 1922 committee and he's now decided that he's going to stand down as chair of the public administration committee as well. So this has cost him. It has and he's also, Mark, decided to give up voluntarily the Conservative whip. So he is now another MP sitting as an independent. There was quite a lot of criticism of Rishi Sunak. They felt that he should have stripped him of the whip, that actually handing over confidential contact details of your colleagues, both fellow politicians and journalists, to an unknown person on the grounds that William Ragg said that he had compromising things on me, they wouldn't leave me alone, so the price I paid was to hand this data over. You know, that's quite a serious matter, and a lot of Conservatives felt that he should have been stripped of the whip, but in fact the criticism has obviously been growing and he's voluntarily surrendered it. And of course it's important to note that he was one of the first MPs to announce that he wasn't standing at the next election, so he can continue for the rest of this Parliament as an independent MP. He's not got to worry about trying to get reselected, mm. and in these circumstances circumstances wouldn't I suspect but I'm afraid his career is is decimated by this. The other thing about this is he failed to follow his own advice. It was a couple of years ago he accused Downing Street under previous management of attempting to coerce him and bully him and even blackmail him and he sat in the chair of his select committee in a public session and said that any MP who was faced with bullying or attempts at blackmail should contact the speaker and if necessary contact the police and of course he did neither. Yeah, and that has been a a quite a significant criticism, you know, the man in the glass house. He's had this reputation because he called in the police a couple of years ago alleging this blackmail by number 10. He's pictured as a sort of pious beacon of morality, if you like very open to criticising the behaviour of others. I mean, you know, when we interviewed him just a couple of weeks ago, of course, he, he is the person who led the charge against the Speaker. The motion of no confidence in the Speaker is in, is in his name. And at this point, when we were interviewing him, these events had taken place. He knew what he'd done. And he talked about the fact that one of the reasons why, as somebody who'd previously supported the Speaker, he was so disappointed was because the Speaker had done the wrong thing. So again, that quite high-minded morality element to his approach and he's now somewhat undone by it his nickname in some circles at Westminster is Towrag. <laughs> 
And there may yet be a sequel to this because it seems quite likely that the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards will have to investigate his conduct. And what then? He might yet, I suppose, uh, just resign his seat and walk away. Yeah, and I think the other element in all of this that's particular to him, a lot of people are sympathetic to him because he's, as we found when we met him, he's a nice guy. And a lot of people have been sympathetic, particularly in the Conservative ranks. I mean, Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, for example, was quite supportive in his remarks about him, talked about the fact he'd given a fulsome apology, he'd owned up to it and so on. But the sort of sense that there's also a concern, he, was it 18 months or so ago, he took some time out from Westminster, he'd had some mental health concerns. One of the reasons he's standing down is tackling what he describes as the black dog, of course, which is that depression of which Churchill, of course, used to speak. So I think people are sympathetic to his concerns. Well, with us also this week is Paul Evans, former Commons clerk. Uh, Paul, what's your take? I would come in a little more sympathetically in some ways because William Rank has a very strong track record as a very independent-minded MP, and he's led the Public Administration Committee, which is the sort of key constitutional committee talking about the centre, quite effectively, and much of what it's done has been good work. And in some ways, I think the story tells us and perhaps tells the public about the extraordinary pressures that there are on MPs and how challenging the job of surviving being an MP is, and we should be sympathetic. There's also the the charge of hypocrisy, as we all know, hypocrisy at some level is a necessary um, element <laughs> of politics. And so this is an, perhaps an extreme example, but holding the government to account to its standards and maintaining your own personal integrity are probably two different tasks. And you can do the one quite well and the other quite badly and still be serving democracy. Well, I'm not trying to exonerate Mr Rag entirely, but I do feel this story should tell us something about what the risks are of being a serving MP in a this way. I had this vision of the people in charge of cyber security in Parliament sort of clapping their hands to their foreheads in despair and thinking to themselves that look, they can protect MPs from an awful lot of menaces, but they can't protect MPs from themselves. And it's just amazing that there's not one but three MPs who felt willing to share these... Uh, in inverted commas, intimate images with people that they'd met online but didn't actually know very well. And I can remember the days when veteran MPs used to tell me that they they were sort of warned, you you find yourself alone in a railway carriage with a woman, get out immediately and change carriages because you don't want the news of the world to come and get you with some allegation of sexual harassment later on. So there used to be blood-curdling warnings about the level of discretion a sitting MP needed to observe. We seem to have gone out the window now. I mean, it sounds like some people are basically emotionally in the fourth form. And I suppose this is just another lesson about, to pick up Ruth's phrase earlier, the glass box in which we all now live, because back in the day, I mean, the Edwardians, I think, probably were the, the masters of this, but they were absolutely rampant with mistresses, <laughs> left, right and centre. <laughs> and it's the old joke, Lloyd George knew my mother. You know. Yeah, visiting guardsmen in the park between divisions and all this kind of thing was going on all the time. And most of it was kept under... The lid, no doubt partly a conspiracy between the media and and the elite, as it were, but it was also because there wasn't just the mechanism to mm. distribute these things. And so I think the world we now live in has added a whole new level of exposure to the lives of MPs. And we're all sinners. It's just that we hope that um, we're not found out sinning, usually. If you're an MP, you've got no, very little chance of getting away with a sin. Yeah. Another strand to this, Paul, is William Ragg having been described in the press as a senior Conservative backbench MP, and quite a few people being quite critical of that phrase, because William is, what, in his sort of early, mid-30s, he's been in Parliament for nearly 10 years, he's chair of a select committee, vice chair, as we said, of the Conservative backbench 1922 committee, but quite a number of people saying, well, you can't really be a senior backbencher when you're only 30-odd. What are your thoughts? I mean, you know, there's been a lot of churn and turnover at Westminster. Is, is it a justifiable description or not? Well, this may not be a name that resonates with many of our audience, but the perfect image of the senior backbencher is Sir Peter Tatzel, the former <laughs> father of the house. And what we expect traditionally from the senior backbenchers, first of all, that they're old, of 30, 40, 50 years service. Yeah. Preferably quite bald. And they have an air of gravitas and um, pomposity about them. That It was, in a funny sort of way, an important thing back in the day, because until the 1990s, the acknowledged principle on which members were called in debates in order to speak backbenchers was seniority. Mm. 
there was a special category of privy councillors, and then you, basically the speakers tended to work by seniority, which meant if you were a, a new sprog with less than five years' service, your chances of ever being called in debate, if it was an interesting debate of any kind, were quite small. So the senior backbenchers not only had this air of authority, but they had more airtime. They were given the mm. chance. Mm -hmm. I think, undoubtedly, being the chair of a select committee, which is quite unusual in the period that um, William Rag managed to achieve that status, nowadays makes you senior in some senses, but it's certainly not senior in the old-fashioned sense. And I suppose the, um, the other issue here is the internal conservative political dimension to this. William Rag was one of the big critics of Boris Johnson, and uh, I think a lot of people see this either as a comeuppance or alternatively see this as an example of the soft line that the Conservative leadership took in not immediately removing the whip from him, as an example of them protecting someone who was a key anti-Johnson conspirator in their view. I think it's always dangerous to ascribe more organisational subtlety to politics than actually exists. A phrase I've always treasured since I first heard it was, you can either be a conspiracy theory of history person, you can be a cock-up theory of history person, but the most sensible position is to be the cocked-up conspiracy theory of history. <laughs> and I just do not think that level of forward planning and strategic thinking about how to um, deploy your weapons is likely to have been in play in this particular case. I think it's a cock-up in all senses of the word. Well, in any event, the, the Commons Privileges Committee might be rather busy in the coming weeks because another strand of what's going on at the moment in Parliament is the suggestion that the government is going to back a motion to investigate the Speaker, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Now, this is over something we discussed repeatedly in this podcast, his decision to allow Labour to put down an amendment on Gaza and a ceasefire in Gaza during a Scottish National Party Opposition Day debate, which was a considerable breach of precedent at the time, and which caused a huge furore. The SNP's already called for an investigation into the allegation that Sir Keir Starmer essentially bullied the Speaker into accepting that amendment, and now it's suggested that the leader of the Commons, Penny Morden, is minded to allow a motion along those lines calling for an investigation to be put to the Commons. And Ruth, this is again a pretty unusual proceeding because the Commons doesn't normally investigate its Speaker's. No, and I, I think, frankly, if we get to this point, I think Sir Lindsay's position becomes very, very difficult. Clearly, Penny Mordaunt has her eye on Keir Starmer. That's who she really has in her sights. But I think the reality is that if the House of Commons were to vote for a motion that called into question and sought an inquiry into the conduct of the Speaker, Sir Lindsay's position becomes almost untenable. Can you imagine the scenario in which the Speaker has to attend a public meeting of the Privileges Committee to be questioned about what was or was not said in a meeting with the Leader of the Opposition, where other people who may or may not have been in the room, whether that's clerks, whether that's Keir Starmer's staff, Sue Gray, for example, his Chief of Staff, is rumoured to have been at discussions. Um, you know, These people are all hauled in for an inquiry. And the discussions between the Speaker and and the party business managers between the leaders of, of the parties are supposed to be confidential. And if we're at this stage, I think his position is incredibly difficult. I mean, Paul, this is ripping the veil from the Holy of Holies, isn't it? The cans of worms have nothing in this because, of course, the Speaker is constantly talking to the leader of the parties, to the whips. And the privacy of those conversations is sort of fundamental to the way it works. Speaker must take responsibility ultimately for their own choices. It takes down the Speaker with anyone else it finds guilty, in a sense. If the Speaker uh, allowed himself to be um, influenced unduly. But what undue influence is, is also a hugely complicated mm -hmm. judgment to make. And as Ruth says, I mean, the idea that officials and others, upon whose loyalty and confidentiality so much depends in terms of the smooth running of the operation and the effective operation of the speakership would be possibly brought in and put on oath and told to repeat what they'd heard. It is quite mind-boggling, and it would be a very unprecedented sight to see the speaker themselves appearing, possibly again, to be put on oath before the Privileges Committee. I'm almost left speechless at the idea uh, that this could happen, and I, I'm inclined to agree with Ruth that it's very hard to see if the speaker found themselves in this position they'd be in a terrible dilemma about how to 
carry on. Let's go through some of the scenarios here then. Does the Speaker say in advance, if this motion is passed, I will have to step down? Because that Mm -hmm. would be attempting to influence a debate of the Commons. It's not something surely a a Speaker would normally do, but it's about him, so maybe his opinion is to some extent valuable on this. Alternatively, does the Speaker simply stay stum, allow one of his deputies to chair the debate and then announce, OK, since you've passed this motion, I'm stepping down? How might it work? Well, I think you're right. It's impossible to imagine the Speaker chairing the debate. And if the motion was agreed, the Speaker would have had to be in, in a clear position, but you know, have made a decision whether they were going to step down. It would theoretically be possible for them to say, I'm stepping aside from active service until the the inquiry is concluded, I suppose. But that doesn't seem to me likely to work, not least because the chances are that the inquiry won't conclude before the dissolution. Mm. They they tend to be very long and drawn out. Well, you you could imagine delaying tactics could be deployed as well, frankly. Yes, indeed. I'd be shocked, shocked, I say, (laughs) if that were to happen. Well, I mean, uh, Boris Johnson cooperated at all stages with the inquiry. And that took a long time, let's say. So um, it really is a very difficult picture to conjure up. I remember reading a a piece by Michael Foote, former Labour leader of the Commons, about a previous speaker, George Thomas, who had written a a set of memoirs which revealed some of his discussions in the late 1970s when the Labour government went into minority status and had to really struggle to maintain control of Parliament and eventually lost a confidence vote in the end. But Michael Foote was absolutely outraged that accounts of his conversations with George Thomas had been published in a book just a few years later. It was an absolutely venomous piece of writing. It was an essay called Brother George, which absolutely dripped with fury from every sentence. And I can imagine that there are plenty of people in the Commons who really wouldn't like their conversations with the Speaker to become public knowledge. There are a lot of people who would not want their conversations with the Speaker to become public knowledge. We should also perhaps recall that there was an attempt to do this through the usual channel, as it were, which is to have a privilege motion, which the three deputy speakers were asked to decide. Normally it's the Speaker's choice whether to allow a motion for privilege to have precedence. He rightly deputed this to his three deputies, who then wrote a letter saying they were not minded to allow it to go forward. So in a slight sense, you know, it brings the judgment of the three deputies Mm. into question as well, if this motion is passed. That would suggest that the House thinks they have misread the situation and come to the wrong determination when they were asked to do so. Well, we don't know whether this is actually going to proceed. And of course, um, we had news just after Easter that the Speaker's father, former Labour MP and Labour peer Lord Hoyle, had sadly died. So I think there'll be some sympathy with him over the the coming weeks. So that might put it off. They may decide not not to proceed with it, but we'll have to see. The other element that we've we've talked about, the, the Privileges Committee, another issue the Privileges Committee may have to consider is the allegations that are coming out in relation to the post office inquiry again, this story that has run and run. We had Lord Arbuthnot on the podcast uh, at the beginning of January. Of course, he appeared in the ITV drama that has brought this scandal to public attention on such a scale. And he was appearing before the inquiry this week. But the, the critical thing for Parliament at the moment is that the former CEO of the post office, Paula Venels, the new recordings have emerged, which suggest quite strongly that she may indeed have misled MPs. She may have misled the select committee on at least two occasions. And Liam Byrne, the current chair of the Business and Trade Committee, has said that he is exploring all the options regarding sanctions and all options are on the table if she has indeed misled Parliament. And Nazim Zahawi, who was one of the MPs on that committee at the time that questioned her and the other post office leadership about the, the scandal, he said that they have to be careful because they've got to, they don't want to prejudice the legal proceedings and the public inquiry, but he thinks that they may be open to, to corporate manslaughter investigation and, and, and possible charges. But if she has misled Parliament, or if there is a case for exploring whether she's misled Parliament, Paul, what what are the options available? The only option available really is a reference again to this now overburdened privileges committee. <laughs> we can go back to yes, we can go back to the phone hacking scandal, which some of our older listeners may remember, where three representatives of News International were accused of lying to the Culture, Media and Sport Committee. Mm. Now this is ten years ago. That was referred to the Privileges Committee. The inquiry dragged on for absolutely ages, partly because it had to be suspended every time a court case started, Mm -hmm. partly because there was a 
intervening in elections and so on. And eventually they came to the conclusion that two of the three accused had indeed deliberately misled Parliament. And we have to be clear that Parliament only gets involved if Ms Vennell's misled MPs in parliamentary proceedings, not if she misled them chatting in the corridor or in a APPG or wherever. An all part of parliamentary happen. group. Yeah. An all part of par parliamentary group or some other context, relatively informal context, only if it was in a committee. That's the only time that does the privilege bite. Mm -hmm. At the end of the inquiry, the two guilty men were admonished, which felt slightly like the punishment didn't fit the crime. There, there's an interesting case coming up in Ottawa next week where, uh, I don't know all the details of it, but someone who's given misleading answers to a select committee in the, of the Canadian House of Commons is being brought to the bar of the House to be not only admonished formally, but then questioned mm. about things that they are alleged to have misled the committee about. And that's going to be a very interesting piece of theatre, which some of the nerdiest people here will be staying up to watch. <laughs> uh, <laughs> turn on, tune in. There hasn't been a sort of miscreant brought to the bar of the House for decades in Britain, has there? I mean, Sir John Junor in, I think, the early 1950s, yeah. as editor of the Sunday Express, I think. Um, someone had written the horrifying suggestion that some MPs might have been es essentially fiddling their petrol rations. Yeah, and right. he, he was brought in and given a thorough telling off by the then Speaker. And no one's attempted to do that since, I think, possibly on the thought that maybe it all looks a bit ridiculous. Yes. After that, Parliament decided it wasn't going to try it again. Partly because, of course, everybody believed that politicians had been fiddling their petrol rations. <laughs> Um, Perish the thought. So it didn't work, and that really put put them off. Now, we had a big Privileges Committee inquiry a couple of years ago. It reported on what punishments are available for people who mislead committees or refuse to attend committees, which is a more common. Dominic Cummings was the no notoriously refused to turn up to a comedian sport committee hearing. I, I can um, just imagine a scene where Dominic Cummings is brought to the, the bar of the house to be admonished and the speaker dons a black tricorn hat and starts <laughs> telling him off and he starts shouting back. And I think yes. you could get something pretty undignified pretty rapidly at that point. You, you could indeed. You can fine, you can imprison in theory, but you can't in practice do either of those things. You're left, basically, with admonishment. Is a pretty Tepid. damp skin, maybe. What so, is the bar of the house, Paul, just for the benefit of our listeners? Oh, so yes. Just to explain the bar, because my understanding is there is actually a bar that comes out of the two seats at the back of the chamber. Is that right? There is a telescopic bar, which can, <laughs> in theory, be drawn. It's never seen. No alcohol is served, drawn out and closed. So the bar of the house is the, as you come in through, as it were, the main entrance at the opposite end of the speaker's chair, there's an area which is regarded as neutral territory. It's not actually inside the house. It's marked by a red line across the carpet between the two benches, just in front of where the sergeant at arms or his deputy is sitting. And that marks this neutral territory so that non-members can step into that area. And as, as you say, there is in fact a bar mm. which can be extended and would be extended if Paul of Annals or anyone else was brought to the bar to show exactly where they had to stop. And you, you remember, you, and you discussed on the programme before, the idea that the um, Procedure Committee came up with... Yes. ...of, um, I think, questioning Lord Cameron at the bar of the House. It has a very unfortunate ring to it, of course, um, yeah. because bar doesn't normally mean that to the general public, but that's what it is. Yeah. Well, of course, this bar of the House and, and bringing David Cameron there to answer Foreign Office questions is, again, you know, back in the news and very pertinent because, you know, we've been talking about this on previous episodes. You know, we talked about it in the abstract, but it's now very real. I mean, David Lammy has written calling for Lord Cameron to appear at that bar to answer questions because of what's happening in Gaza, because of all the debate about whether or not the government's got legal advice about the Israeli government's behaviour and whether that should affect whether or not there should be sales of weapons to Israel, whether contracts should continue. And, of course, the terrible incident in Gaza where three British citizens' aid workers were killed as a result of an Israeli strike. So it's really pertinent again. But, I mean, David Cameron last appeared before the Foreign Affairs Committee on the 9th of January. And if you recall, Mark, when we talked to Alicia Kearns a few weeks ago, the Foreign Affairs Committee were wanting him to commit to meet every six weeks and could not get that commitment from him. And as far as I'm aware, he hasn't agreed to it yet. So, it, again, it's, this is going to be interesting. Will they agree to him coming to the Bar of the House? I'm somewhat sceptical. 
I think it also it could look a bit ridiculous, but um, <laughs> as I made clear in my evidence to the procedure committee, but I'm sceptical yeah. that he will he will ever appear there to answer questions. Like all things in Parliament, setting a precedent is a very dangerous matter, and uh, it would definitely set some kind of precedent. Though it would also be going back to the days in history when witnesses before really select committees were in their full fig. Um, witnesses were examined at the bar of the house, most famously Benjamin Franklin, I think. Ah. But that's a long way in the past. <laughs> Very distant precedent. Well, I think, uh, Ruth, that's probably a good moment for us to take a break. Great. Thanks, Paul. 80 years ago, Winston Churchill and Clement Attlee, sitting together in the House of Commons smoking room, paid a £1 subscription and so became the first members of the Hansard Society. The challenges facing our democracy are different to those that motivated them to help found the society in 1944, but they are just as urgent. So to mark this important milestone, we're launching the Churchill Attlee Democracy Lecture, and we're delighted that former Prime Minister Theresa May has agreed to give the inaugural speech on Tuesday 14th of May. She'll reflect on her life in Parliament, drawing on the unparalleled insights she's gleaned during her time as Prime Minister and as a backbench MP. With a wealth of experience in the corridors of Westminster, her lecture will explore what's wrong with Parliament and why and how it must change. So why not join us as we honour the legacies of our first members, Churchill and Attlee, with what promises to be a thought-provoking exploration of the challenges facing Parliament in the years ahead. Go to the Hansard Society website, hansardsociety.org.uk, and book your ticket now. That's hansardsociety.org.uk. And Ruth, we're back and continuing our excursion round uh, events while Parliament's not been sitting. I suppose we've really got to talk about the resignation of Geoffrey Donaldson as leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, the major Protestant party in Northern Ireland, after he was charged with historic sex offences. And this is something that came completely out of the blue, but which is clearly going to have enormous implications for Northern Ireland politics, but also raises some very tricky problems for Westminster in terms of the way that MPs in this situation are handled by the system and the safety of staff and other users of the Palace of Westminster is guaranteed when someone is charged with a sex offence. Yeah, it was described in the media in, in Northern Ireland as a political earthquake just weeks after the restoration of power at Stormont, in which he'd been so instrumental in getting back up and running. We obviously can't say anything about the charges. That's that's now a, a legal matter. And we don't know much in detail other than that he's going to be appearing in court later this month and he's strenuously contesting all the charges, we should say that. But in terms of the implications for Westminster, I mean, we've talked a number of times now on the podcast in recent weeks about this difficult question of the risk-based exclusion policy, you know, where an MP is accused of serious allegations whether or not they should be permitted to be on the parliamentary estate. This is a contested policy that Penny Morden and the, the House of Commons Commission, the sort of the senior MPs in charge of the governance of the House, if you like, they, they want a system where if an MP is accused of quite serious allegations, which would raise questions about security and safety of so people around them... So basically sex or violence allegations. Yeah, that they would be subject to a process of... Uh, the case would be investigated by a panel. They wouldn't necessarily know the identity of the MP at that time, but they'd know broadly what the nature of the investigation and the allegations were, and they would make a judgment as to whether or not that member should be able to come to Westminster or whether they should be excluded from the estate for a period and should have in that period therefore a proxy vote. Now, this has been subject to a lot of political debate. The trade unions representing staff, for example, are very clear that they want this to protect the security and safety of staff. But at a political level, it raises all sorts of constitutional questions about whether MPs should be excluded, particularly if they've uh, only initially been investigated and no charges have been made, because, you know, the constitutional role, who would represent their constituents if they can't come into Westminster? And, uh, it, and you, also it could be gamed. You know, all yes. you have to have is someone saying, making an allegation. It then has to be investigated. Yeah. Oh, look, they're being investigated. We can't let them yeah. on the estate. And as we've talked about previously, you know, a number of these cases which are subject to investigation by the political parties are dragging on for a very long time. And therefore, again, you know, if you are excluding members while they're under investigation, this can go on for years. Is. So strong arguments on both sides, but the policy was withdrawn, and they went back and had a had a look at it. And they've they've, as I understand it, they sort of enhanced it so that it wouldn't apply if MPs were simply being investigated.
prosecuted, but it would apply if they were charged. Now, of course, that is what has happened to Geoffrey Donaldson. Yeah. But the policy has not yet been put to the Commons because certainly a number of they Conservative MPs it. want to amend it. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a number of backbench Conservative MPs are, are opposed to it, concerned about it, want to amend it. So they've pulled it and it's still sitting there on the future business papers of the House of Commons, but there's no timetable for it to be debated and voted on. And you've um, got to say that this is a moment on which uh, having a solid agreed policy would have come in rather handy. Yes, because the question now is, where does this leave Geoffrey Donaldson? Where does it leave his constituents? Where does it leave fellow MPs and staff at Westminster? Because as far as I can tell, there is nothing that would prevent Geoffrey Donaldson coming to Westminster if he wants to. Some of these cases have been handled in the past on the basis of a sort of private agreement with the Speaker's Office and the Whips. Well, he doesn't have a whip now because he's no longer effectively a member of the DUP's parliamentary party. Of course, he's got a court case to fight. I doubt that he's going to want to resign because of the way in which that could be interpreted as a sort of an omission of guilt, possibly. But his time and his attention is, is inevitably going to be spent in the, the law courts and the, the judicial process in Northern Ireland. So, so, so once again, I'm afraid it's got to be said the failure of the Commons to bite this particular bullet means that there isn't an agreed policy. So you're stuck in this rather murky territory of gentlemen's agreements with the Speaker or the Whips or whoever about the conduct of a person who's been charged with a serious offence. And it just sort of hangs there, as you say, in midair. Mm. And it's a pity that the Leader of the House didn't feel able to put the motion down mm. and get it sorted, amended or otherwise, so that there was a solid way of dealing with these situations, because I'm sure this won't be the last. No, we'll have to see what, see what happens with that case and whether he does turn up at Westminster or not. Well, let's turn our eyes to another intriguing issue, uh, the mystery of the disappearing all-party parliamentary groups. I suppose, Ruth, we'd better yes. start by explaining exactly what an all-party parliamentary group, or APPG for short, actually is. Yeah, so it's, it's a, a cross-party, as it implies, all-party group of MPs. They're organised in either subject, thematic subject Yeah, and there's areas. all sorts of things, aren't there? There's all-party groups on, on countries, there are all-party groups yeah. on diseases or different types yeah. of cancer or particular subject areas, you know, transport, airports, yeah, whatever. Yeah, basically if you've got a policy area or a campaign that you, you want to, to push, raise awareness of it, a good way is an all-party parliament group in which you a number of MPs and peers who are interested in these issues can meet together and discuss the issues. And of course, we talked earlier uh, on an earlier episode with Theodora Clark, the Conservative MP who was leading the all-party parliamentary group on baby loss. That was a good example of how she's used that all party parliamentary group to br raise awareness of the issue and to have an inquiry into some of the policy and legislative changes that are needed. The other side of the coin, and it's been going for a long time, is criticism that's made of all party parliamentary groups that they are a back route for foreign influence, for foreign countries, foreign states paying for MPs to go on, on visits yeah, to, so to countries that sort of jolly. government takes a, a group of MPs on, on a five star trip to some exotic place yeah. and basically in effect is attempting to buy their goodwill by yeah. doing that and then you know the mps go back to westminster they're very impressed by it all and they sort of, you know they ask questions that helpful helpful questions, questions. so sort of both both the criticism about how it impacts in terms of parliamentary process and their responsibilities but also this argument that it's a you know it's all a bit of a jolly the other one is that they're a route for corporate influence that the secretariats that run and organize these all party parliamentary groups are often funded by corporate sector they're also funded and organized by charities but the perception is that it's a way for big business to lobby and exercise influence behind the scenes and that there's not enough accountability. So what has happened is that there was a, a standards committee inquiry into all party parliamentary groups because there was this concern about potential for them being the next big scandal. New rules have been introduced, which came into effect at the end of March. They're about providing more robust transparency requirements, banning overseas funding, trying to reduce the foreign influence so you've got more enhanced financial reporting, cracking down on the number of groups that MPs could be a member of because some MPs were signed up to so many that it clearly wasn't a it's serious endeavour. They've got to have a minimum number of officers. MPs can only sit in a maximum of six groups in the next parliament. That rule will come in in the, in the next parliament. 
they've got to be much more open about their income and their expenditure and who's running the organisation and so on. And all this has had a visible effect now. Yeah, so this is a story that uh, we should credit to My Society, which is the organisation, you may have heard of them, they run the, the, the sites, they work for you, fix my street, write to them, what do they know? Those kinds of sort of active citizenship projects that are allied to using technology to and help people engage in democracy. And they've been tracking the all-party parliamentary group register and looking at the number of groups that were registered prior to the rule change and those that have registered this month. And they have found that there's been a 39% reduction in the number of APPGs. So 288 of the 722 that existed last month, 288 of them appear to have disappeared from the register. In a puff of smoke. But the question is, have they disappeared altogether or have they, as it were, gone underground and stopped being formal all-party parliamentary groups and now there's some sort of slightly loose, nebulous network out there that doesn't fall foul of this regulation? Yeah, and that's something that... um, the investigative journalist Peter Gagan has been looking at, and he's been looking at, are they in fact taking on a different form? So they're not calling themselves all party parliamentary groups. They won't be able to use the portcullis logo that's permitted for APPGs. But in order to avoid the the transparency and the accountability that comes with these registration requirements, they're calling themselves something different, like a parliamentary liaison group, for example. So he's been tracking, you know, a number of changes where groups that were APPGs have now rebadged themselves. Now, you mentioned the logo. Are there any other advantages to being a full-scale all-party parliamentary group? Do they, for example, carry some level of parliamentary privilege? I've been to evidence hearings held by all party parliamentary groups where the chair has started off by saying order order for all the mm. world as if this was a select committee mm. or something do they actually have some level of privilege so that for example people can't be sued for the evidence that they give to an all party parliamentary no, group no i mean all party parliamentary groups are not formal parliamentary proceedings and they're not formal parliamentary bodies or committees they have the aura of parliamentary authority and are often reported in that way by but the media. But not the reality. But they're not the reality. For example, parliamentary staff, you know, the clerks of the House of, of Commons and the House of Lords are not involved in organising mm. and running them, which is why they need the secretariats organised by external bodies to help run them. Or, as we found with Theodora Clark's baby loss inquiry, they've got their own, effectively, their own parliamentary staff or perhaps working with a, with a charity. So... No, they they don't carry the imprimatur of Parliament itself, but a lot is in the name. But clearly, once these financial transparency and accountability rules are now biting, there's a willingness to lose that and and rebadge themselves to kind of carry on and exercise the influence and and work in a different way. Uh, This is definitely a space that we'll have to watch. Indeed. Well, let's take a look at some of the things that are coming up in Parliament in either next week or or the near future, and not least the continuing saga of the Rwanda Bill. The Rwanda Bill has been through the Commons, it's been before the House of Lords, the House of Lords has made a number of changes the government doesn't like, and the Bill's been bouncing back between the Commons and the Lords in the fabled parliamentary ping-pong to get them to agree the details, and it's due back in front of their Lordships again this week. It is. So, I mean, first of all, the Commons have got consideration of Lords' amendments on Monday, Day for a couple of hours. Oh, right. So, so the Commons have still got a, a round com- to go. Commons have got a round to go. So um, the expectation is the government's going to say no to all the Lords' amendments. So one assumes then it will go back to the Lords and the Lords will then face the question, are they prepared to put back in their amendments or to, you know, some form of am- amendment of their amendments? Um, yeah, you, you can sometimes offer a slightly watered yeah. down version or a differently worded version. So yeah. not insisting on precisely the yeah. same thing again. But this is quite high-powered stuff about, for example, the legal presumption that the government wishes to create that Rwanda is safe and that all sorts of removals from this country can't be challenged on the basis that Rwanda is not safe. So the Lords want to take out all all those rules that foreclose all kinds of challenges to deportations to Rwanda from that. And it may be that the Lords once again put their changes back in and it has to be sent to, the bill has to be sent back to the Commons for MPs to take them out again. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of who blinks first. Yeah, and and I think a, a lot is going to depend, as, as we've discussed previously, on what's the position of the crossbench peers here. Do you know they very cross in this case? <laughs> very cross. Uh, uh, do, do they want to keep to keep pressing, and just quite having a, another go and, and see? Well, I don't think they're going to get anywhere with the government, but you know, to to try and put the pressure on. They're clearly digging their heels in. What classically happens on these occasions is that eventually the crossbenchers say, "Well, we've tried." Yeah. 
And even if the opposition parties are whipping furiously to try and keep the bill in play, eventually the majority to do that dissolves. Mm. And another thing to watch out for is whether some of the Conservative peers who so far haven't shown up to vote for the government line do eventually come in just on the basis of asserting that Mm. uh, at some point the unelected chamber has to give way to the Mm. elected chamber. The other thing to keep in mind, of course, it's the first day back after recess. So will there be any ministerial statements? Dozens, I would imagine. Will there be anything in terms of... there's, There's been some speculation in the media about whether or not the accommodation that's apparently being paid for to, to house the asylum seekers and migrants, illegal migrants that the government wants to send to Rwanda, whether in fact those have actually already been allocated by the Rwandan government to some of their own population. So a possible ministerial statement or urgent question on that. But another thing to keep an eye on is the Public Accounts Committee on Monday has got the Home Office Permanent Secretary and some of the other Home Office officials back in front of them to discuss asylum accommodation and the UK-Rwanda uh, partnership. And they've had a pretty rough handling from the Public Accounts Committee before. They have, and we've discussed on, on the pod before that Matthew Rycroft, the Permanent Secretary at the, the Home Office, has had a very rough ride. I suspect he'll get exactly the same again. These questions about what's happening with Rwanda uh, accommodation will be discussed. And does anything emerge from that hearing that will play into this wider debate during ping-pong in, in the Commons and Lords. So we'll have to have to keep an eye out. And in the legislative side of things, it's also going to be the week in which the Commons debates the tobacco bill. Rishi Sunak's attempt to eventually more or less phase smoking out. There'll be a sort of older and older age at which you're allowed to buy tobacco till hopefully they reckon they stamp out an awful lot of smoking. Now, Boris Johnson has weighed in on this this week, saying that it's bizarre that the party of Churchill wants to outlaw cigars. And so uh, I think you may find that this is a bill that upsets the sensibilities of quite a number of Conservative backbenchers. They may think it's just flatly unconservative to be trying Mm. to bring in a ban like this. So it'll be quite a test of Rishi Sunak's authority, whether he can actually get this bill through. Now, it may not be that it fails at the second reading vote. No, I mean, it, I think it's it highly unlikely. It may be unlikely, far but... more likely that someone puts down an amendment to try and gut the detail of the bill. I question whether it would get Labour support or other opposition party support, but mm. it'll be a sign of Conservative backbench discontent and a lot of rumbling there. And uh, an embattled prime minister might find that somehow this is one of those issues that becomes a kind of rallying point with significance far beyond the actual legislation itself. Mm. We've also got uh, this week the second reading of the finance bill, which, of course, enshrines many of the proposals that were set out in the Chancellor's budget a few weeks ago. So that that will be underway. And uh, another thing to look out for is a Westminster Hall debate on Tuesday led by Labour MP Debbie Abrahams on citizens' assemblies. Yes, yeah, citizens' assemblies are suddenly a very fashionable idea because the suggestions that uh, a Keir Starmer government would use them to break a number of sort of policy deadlocks. Uh, being old-fashioned, I, I kind of slightly take the view that we've got a citizens' assembly already and it's called the House of Commons. But these have been very important in other countries for breaking political deadlocks, notably in Ireland, where a citizens' assembly paved the way for the legalisation of abortion. So they can be a very interesting political tool. And uh, Debbie Abrahams being, I had imagined, a supporter of these, it'll be quite interesting to see if any people who think that citizens' assemblies are a bad idea or a kind of political constitutional cop-out decide to come and have a bit of fun as well. Yeah. And then um, perhaps about to end where we started, William Ragg. He's yeah. actually on the order paper for, you, for a backbench business debate on access to redress schemes on Thursday. So it'd be interesting to see whether or not that takes place or whether he withdraws and he's keeping his head down. Well, these backbench motions are normally put by a group of MPs, so it may be that discretion is the better part of valour and somebody else fronts up this debate, if, if only, so that um, the pros and cons of William Ragg's personal situation doesn't <laughs> interfere yeah. with an issue that's uh, pretty important yeah. in its own right. Yeah. So with that, Mark, I think we'll leave it uh, there for this week. Can I just say thank you to all our listeners? Whilst we've been uh, having a short break over Easter, we've been doing some analysis of the podcast data. Who's listening? Who's out there? And uh, apparently we've got listeners in 108 countries. So everything from America, Canada, Australia, Germany, France, to Seychelles and Myanmar. So to everyone out there who is listening, we're really grateful. Do let us know on social media or uh, you can you can email us through the uh, the contact form the urgent questions hansarsociety.org.uk slash pm let us know what you think and uh, it's great to have you with us see you soon see you soon (laughs) 
Well, that's all from us for this week's episode of Parliament Matters. Please hit the follow or subscribe button in your podcast app to get the next episode as soon as it lands. And help us to make the podcast better by leaving a rating or review on Apple or Spotify and sharing your feedback. Our producer tells us it's important for the algorithm to give the show a boost. And Mark, tell us more about the algorithm. Well, what do I know about algorithms? You know, I write my scripts with a quill pen on vellum and then send it in by carrier pigeon. <laughs> Well, before we go, a quick reminder also that you can send us your questions on all things Parliament by visiting hansardsociety.org.uk slash PMEUQ. We'll be discussing them in future episodes, including our special Urgent Questions editions dedicated to what you want to know about Parliament. And you can find us across social media at Hansard Society to get more content related to the show and the wider work of the Hansard Society. Parliament Matters is produced by the Hansard Society and supported by the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust. For more information, visit hansardsociety.org.uk pm or find us on social media at Hansard Society. Yeah.